Gaius et alus, Kellos el Tates in Historia Mokai, so ex affilio tel ethnico im nu abo en abo te pelateria melito planeti, tin elada, stin oragia tin ethniki mera ezekini some. Or, hello everyone, welcome to my history and cover of the national anthem of one of the oldest countries of them all, Greece, in time for its national day. If nothing else, then let's begin. During an excavation at the Apodema Cave of southern Greece in the 1970s, a history-changing discovery was made. Bones. These bones were by a landslide, the oldest ever found in Greece, and possibly anywhere outside of the African continent. These bones were dated to be 210,000 years old, meaning one thing. These were Neanderthals. However, the Neanderthals wouldn't stay in Greece for so long as the diseases of our ancestors, the earliest form of Homo sapiens, made them disappear faster than California drivers when they see cops. Starting 15,000 years ago in 13,000 BCE, Greece entered the Mesolithic period. In it, people went into caves to do whatever it is cave people and caves in the cave age do in Greece. One of the largest archaeological sites from this time is in, you guessed it, a cave, known as the French T Cave, which doesn't sound Greek at all. It was found to contain many artifacts when it was discovered, like bones, and whatever you can expect someone with an IQ of less than 50 to leave behind in a cave tens of thousands of years ago. Starting 11,000 years ago, in 9,000 BCE, Greece's amazing technology was about to get more amazing. By amazing, I mean people using soft rocks began using hard rocks. During the Bronze Age, people living in Greece and those hitchhiking to it from Anatolia, aka Turkey today, began farming crops on the little land there is in Greece, since it's narrow. And more importantly, these people began developing a proto-Greek language, although to a Greek person today, it would sound like Boris Yeltsin when he is a little tipsy. <laughs> Starting 5,200 years ago in 3,200 BCE was Greece's first culture, the Cycladic culture. The Cycladic people were weird. They were known for two things, making so many figurines of female gods like they were ancient feminists, and making so many frying pans, so there's that. They disappeared around 3,000 years ago for some reason, but the central islands of Greece today are now known as the Cyclads and were named after them, so there's that. 200 years after the Cycladic people disappeared, came the much, much more famous and important Minoans. The Minoans were the first true civilization in all of Europe. They were also known for some odd things, like their weird hairstyles, their addiction to copper, being BFFs with the leadership of ancient Egypt like the pharaoh, and their palaces, like the famous one at Knossos. However, in 1600 BCE, at the island that is now Thera, or Thera, or Santorini, a monstrous volcanic eruption began. It was by far the largest eruption in European history, and the second largest in human history. After, the island went from looking like this to this. So yeah, Santorini is built on the caldera, or crater rim, of the active supervolcano. Charming. Starting 3,600 years ago and roughly 1600 BCE after the Santorini eruption or the Minoan eruption was the emergence of a new people, the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans will lay the groundwork for the famed civilizations to come, mostly by establishing some of Greece's largest cities, like Athens, but it probably wasn't called that. However, there would be more to the Mycenaeans than just that. They had an elaborate system revolving around their king, or Wanax, including their most famous one, who I might have very, very, very distant connections to, King Agamemnon. However, the Bronze Age collapse began with the invasions and disappearances caused by the Sea People. I talked about them in my history of Egypt. Basically, these people who we still don't know who they are invaded. They didn't really conquer anyone, then they disappeared and they just caused the Bronze Age collapse, so yeah, not nice. Not a good time to be alive overall. Finally, we have reached the most famous period of Greek history, Ancient Greece. During this time, the Athenians in Athens began laying the foundations of democracy and republics. The first Olympic Games were held in 776 BCE, 
the Greek language was finally mostly done evolving, mostly, and however, a new group would emerge from the south of Greece in what's called the Peloponnese, a peninsula by the way, marking the beginning of a living hell for the Athenians. In 490 BCE in the south of Greece, a new civilization rose to prominence. The Spartans! No, I can't include that scene from 300 or else Warner Bros. Studios will have me assassinated, take down my YouTube channel, and erase my family heritage. In 490 BCE, the most famous king of Sparta began his rule, King Leonidas. And so, now as king, he was like, I'm too sick of calling the Athenians. It's too easy. How about we go east? What's on the east side of us? Oh, the Persian Empire? Let's go to war with them. And so, on September 8th, 480 BCE, the Spartans and Persians met each other at the infamous Battle of Thermopylae. After being vastly outnumbered, the Spartans were easily defeated by the Persians, leading to the death of King Leonidas. And so, the surviving Spartans went back to Greece and invaded Athens for a nice weekend jaunt. From 431 BCE to 404 BCE, Athens and Sparta fought each other again in their biggest conflict, the Peloponnesian War. Once again, the Athenians were crushed by the Spartans, leading to the Spartans introducing a new form of government to the Athenians, an oligarchy, where a elite group of people got to rule over all others. I wonder who uses that today. From 356 BCE to 323 BCE came the reign of Greece's most famous conqueror of all time, Alexander the Great. By his death, he had conquered all of mainland Greece today and a few islands. Not much happened for the next two centuries other than the Greeks' weird children offspring things taking over Egypt known as the Ptolemaics, including Cleopatra. However, in 146 BCE, Greece would be conquered once again by Rome during the period of 146 BCE to roughly the year 325, Rome would be able to completely take control of every acre of Greece today. During their hold on Greece, not much happened other than them trying to eliminate all followers of that weird thing called Christianity. Starting in 325, after the unpopularity of the Western Roman Empire reached a boiling point, the Eastern Roman Empire decided to become more Greek, while still calling themselves the Roman Empire and pretending that they weren't becoming more Greek. This led to the creation of the Byzantine Empire. It's not Byzantine, it's Byzantine. Named after its capital of Byzantium, or later Constantinople, and no, I can't include any of that song by They Might Be Giants, since I will be murdered for copyright. Also during this time was the rule of Constantine the Great, who was very friendly to Christians, making them happy and making these people not so happy. In 527, the most famous Byzantine emperor, Justinian the Great, became emperor. During his reign as emperor, he built the Hagia Sophia, which would later become a mosque, then another basilica, then a mosque, and then a museum, and then another mosque again. He also protected his empire from collapsing for now. Over the next few centuries, the Byzantine Empire would provide the Roman Catholic Church with some people who had a death wish to help fight the Muslim forces who were occupying the holiest city in the world, Jerusalem. This was primary in the 1200s, and yeah, that's all I have for here. On May 29th, 1453, Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks after a months-long siege. With this came the deaths of 4,000 people, and the end of the Byzantine Empire. By 1520, all of modern-day Greece had been conquered by the Ottoman Empire. Greece would stay part of the Ottoman Empire for three centuries. During its three centuries under the Ottomans, stuff would happen. Some of the stuff was the establishment of Islam as the official language, Christianity getting swept under the carpet, a lot of torture and discrimination against the Greeks, and a lot of the same thing going towards minority populations, and as a result, the Greeks had a mood of revolution. From 1821 to 1829, the Greeks became so sick of Ottoman rule that they began a revolution. Now known as either the Greek War of Independence or the Greek Revolution, this became the time to finally free Greece from the Ottomans. The Greek War of Independence started on this day, March 25th, exactly 200 years ago in 1821. 100,000 deaths and 8 years later came the surrender of the Ottomans. 
With this, the Greeks finally had their own country, the first Hellenic Republic. However, it would be replaced with the Kingdom of Greece 10 years later. From 1832 to 1973, Greece would be led under the Kingdom of Greece. It was at times a soft and peaceful monarchy and at times a fascist and hardcore monarchy, practically a dictatorship. So you can imagine why it wouldn't last forever. The most famous person from the Greek royal family ever is probably, in my opinion, Prince Philip, Queen Elizabeth II's husband. Although he never ruled or gained any titles, really, he was born into the family. However, he and a few of his family members had to leave because of war. Speaking of war... From 1912 to 1913, Greece and many other Balkan countries in Southern Europe took part in the appropriately named Balkan Wars against the Ottoman Empire and a few of its tiny allies since it still existed. The Ottoman Empire lost and would be dissolved seven years later. During World War I, from 1914 to 1918, Greece fought in World War I in it. The king and prime minister fought with each other on who to favor, the Allies or the Axis powers. The king wanted to support the Axis powers, and the prime minister wanted to support the Allies. The prime minister won, and Greece would win with the Allies in World War I, losing 24,000 people. During World War II, Greece would also be supported by the Allies and support them, losing 35,000 people as well. In 1974, the current Republic of Greece, the Third Hellenic Republic, was founded. In 1981, Greece joined the European Union, and in 2010, Katerina Sakalaropoulou became President of Greece. And there it was, my history of Greece. Thanks for watching part one of my Greece history and national anthem video. Now for part two, the national anthem. I now present my cover of the Greek national anthem, Imnos Istin Eleftheria, or Hymn to Liberty. It is the longest national anthem in the world, at an hour long in full form. Don't worry, I'm just playing the main part, or the choral part, or whatever you want to call it which most Greek people who are normal just perform, which is only two minutes long. So yeah, without further ado, here is my cover of the Greek National Anthem. Enjoy! With that, that was my history and cover of the national anthem of the land known as Hellas, or Gris. Thanks so much for watching. As for what is coming up next, it will be an, a request for once, and it will be on the history and cover of the national anthem of Menostan. It will come out in a week from today. Thanks for watching this video. Happy Greek National Day. Thanks for watching.